Hello, my name is George Hewn, and this is a Rubik's Cube. There are billions and billions of possible configurations of a Rubik's Cube. Actually, there are more than 43 quintillion possible configurations. Trying to find the single correct solution is extraordinarily difficult. Or, consider a 60-ball, 6-to-win lottery. There are over 50 million possible outcomes. Now, consider a project portfolio of only 40 projects, where you can't afford to fund or staff all of the projects, so you want to find the set of projects that delivers the most value to your firm, while not also exceeding your capital, resource, timing, and risk constraints. In that 40 project portfolio, there are over 1 trillion, that's right, 1 trillion possible subsets of projects for you to choose from. And the number of possible subsets grows exponentially as the project portfolio grows. So if we even add just five more projects to our 40 project portfolio, we now have over 35 trillion possible portfolio subsets to choose from. Therefore, the odds of finding an optimal portfolio using just a spreadsheet and trying to do it manually are far, far lower than winning the lottery, which is the reason why real project portfolio optimization is so important for getting the maximum value from your project portfolio. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what project portfolio optimization actually is. It isn't about so-called balancing a portfolio or just picking the most valuable projects or simply reaching an agreement about a certain set of projects to execute. When I talk about optimization, I'm speaking to systematically and rigorously extracting the maximum value from your portfolio within the limits of multiple simultaneous constraints, such as limited capital, limited resources, limited time, and tolerance for risk. These include maximizing returns from constrained capital, maximizing returns from constrained resources, maximizing return from time constraints, controlling your risk exposure, including non-financial and strategic project value, managing uncertainty, including non-discretionary spending, and accounting for complex project dependencies. Now, let's look graphically at what it means to find an optimal portfolio. This three-dimensional graph represents a 12-project portfolio where the x-axis is the number of employees, the y-axis is cost, and the z-axis is the portfolio value. This 12-project portfolio has about 4,100 solutions, and we can see them charted here. The optimal solutions are where the highest surface peaks or maxima are located. So, finding an optimal portfolio means locating the maximum value peaks in the area defined by your constraint criteria. Now this is a very small portfolio with only two attributes and 4,100 solutions, and you can display it visually. But when you get many more projects and many more constraints and trillions of possible solutions, it's much more complex. You can't find the solution graphically or by using spreadsheets. So this is the real problem that portfolio optimization solves, and it really involves two steps. First, it involves prioritizing your projects by a value score, and second, it involves using some kind of optimizer to maximize the overall value of the selected portfolio while not exceeding your constraints. Now, in regards to prioritizing projects, I talk about that in another video, but I want to mention here that a solid, defensible, and robust prioritization methodology is essential for project portfolio optimization. So, let's assume that you've got a good set of value scores for your projects and you're ready to optimize your portfolio. How do you do this? Well, the first thing you want to do is understand what your constraints are. We've talked about some of the obvious ones already, things like capital, resources, and risk. But there are others that you might be considering, such as project dependencies, timing, and plant and equipment capacities. All of these constraints need to be considered simultaneously when you're optimizing your portfolio. And if you try to do this with a spreadsheet, you'll immediately see the problem. If you pick just the highest value projects by going down the list until you run out of capital, you may just find that you don't have enough resources to do all those projects. So then you try to find a set that meets both your cost and resource constraints, only to find out that the project set is now too risky. So then you work hard, think of a Rubik's Cube here, and trying to match the colors on each side of the cube to meet your cost, resources, and risk constraints, only to find out that it doesn't meet your project dependency constraints. And so you keep trying to do this manually on and on and on, 
And even if you finally find a solution that meets all the constraint requirements, you still won't know whether or not it's an optimal or near-optimal solution. And based on the sheer number of possibilities, the chances are that it isn't. Which is why it is critical to use an optimizer to help you find optimal and near-optimal portfolio subsets in order to extract the most value from your project portfolios. And once you have optimized portfolio, you can't start pulling individual projects out or adding individual projects in without destroying the optimization because in a well-optimized portfolio, every project selected is selected in relationship to all the other projects selected. If you pull one project out, then the constraint totals change, the portfolio values change, and the basis for the optimization, maximizing portfolio value within your constraint limitations, is changed. Essentially, you've gone back to doing it manually. Another question that I'm asked is, will optimizers always find the optimal solution? The answer to this is no, because there may not be a portfolio that meets your constraint criteria, or there may be multiple project subsets that satisfy the optimization constraint criteria and have identical value scores, or there just may be too many possible solutions to find the single optimal solution if one exists. Therefore, a good portfolio optimizer will find optimal or near-optimal solutions, where a near-optimal solution is generally within a few percentage points of the absolute optimal solution. So now, let's take a quick look at how optimizations are managed in OPSI. There are several other videos on our site that go into much more detail than we're going to go into here, but I want to just give you an overview of how easy it is. First of all, notice that we can optimize to any attribute, but we're going to optimize to overall value. Second of all, the optimization form lets you essentially dial in your constraints and your project dependencies. So you can see that the cost constraint for this optimization has been set for not greater than 750. You can see that the required resources has been set for not greater than 90. Our risk criteria, the percent probability of success, has been set to a mean of not less than 60%. In other words, the average probability of success for the selected portfolio will not be less than 60%. And our time to launch has been set to a mean not greater than 12 months, or, in other words, the average time to launch for the selected portfolio will not exceed 12 months. Being able to set the average constraints in a portfolio optimization is something that is a unique feature of OPSI. OPSI also lets you set up different dependency sets so you can easily try different ones without having to set them up each time. You set them using this drop-down menu. Once you have set up your optimization, you click Optimize to Run. The optimizer uses an optimization engine that has been specifically designed for finding optimal portfolios. When the optimization is complete, you can see the results in your form, which shows you how the found optimal portfolio meets your constraint criteria. So, in this example, it found an optimal portfolio with an overall value of 691.2. You could spend 718 of your $750 million budget. You could utilize all 90 of your resources. The average probability of success for all the projects is around 62%, and the average time to launch is 12 months. If we toggle open the form, we can see the results of the dependencies that we set, which projects were selected and which projects weren't, based on our dependencies. This makes it super easy to understand how the optimized portfolio selected the projects based on the dependencies. And finally, the graph at the bottom shows how the optimization progressed over time. If we look at the portfolio form, we can see which projects were selected and which projects were rejected in this optimization. The check marks indicate that the project was selected and the X's indicate that the project was rejected. There are a lot more features in OPSI to let you easily run, save, and compare optimal portfolios using different constraints, dependencies, and non-discretionary projects that we're not going to discuss here, but you can see on other videos or read about on our site. And you can try the OPSI Optimizer on your project portfolios for free by signing up for your free trial at our website, www.datamachines.com. My name is George Hewn, and thanks for watching.